See, I appreciate what you just said there, and that is, and this might go for every theoretical difference, that we have to get clear about what we are embracing, whatever it might be. Yes. And then we can more adequately uh, fold in complementarity from another model. But, I, I, you know, that's when I think the richness for, for multiple perspectives really shines. But it doesn't shine if we're just so eclectic that we're not clear about what we really think. So I, I embrace what you're saying. Earlier in the, in the break, is it Laura? Laura was asking me about her son, and I said to Laura what I said routinely, and you have just said here, is that in a nutshell, you can't feel too good about yourself. And you feel good about yourself, you develop self-esteem from your basic functions. In my mind, if the better you feel about this self, the more humble you become, because you see your strengths, then you will see your implicit weaknesses. But to help Laura and her son with a minor weakness, I affirm, as I would normally do with parents, let's affirm what he, or in some cases she, might do well. Oh, she doesn't uh, like reading, writing, arithmetic, but she loves to play the flute. Let her play the flute for three years, feel good about herself, then she'll learn to read. Just to respond to your question, uh, one of the uh, great revelations and uh, huge gifts to me was from Joe Wheelwright, whom, the name that some of you will know. But uh, Joe Wheelwright said to me one time, Boris, you're not a thinking type, you're a feeling type. Well, uh, that was a revelation because I, was, I thought I was supposed to be a thinker and I couldn't get off square one. I couldn't even get up to that as a thinker. And so when Joe pointed that out to me, it was immensely helpful. And now, several years later, uh, in fact, my thinking function has gotten just a whole lot better. It's not exactly generative, and it's not going to be original. But I can follow, and, uh, and, and I can follow and see whether there's a flaw in somebody else's thinking. So you're absolutely right, Mary, and Ron, you're absolutely right, starting with recognizing what one is and building on that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a huge task. Okay, so again, if you don't mind, just very briefly, uh, on the left side, terminology that I would use would be external, uh, high boundary, objective and objective, you know, meaning of the, uh, the functions, and internal and low boundary and, and other subjective. This isn't a terminology you have to use, I just find it more usable, uh, especially, especially the term internal and, and external. Okay, granting that there, we're racing through this and uh, Boris and I earlier in this year decided we just couldn't do any kind of justice to all of this. There's so much here. There really is. There's so much here. Uh, Laura and I were talking earlier again about thinking and, and uh, feeling function. I mean, uh, Boris and I do quite well on this dimension, partly because he pretended to be a thinker for such a long time, you know, and that we can engage at that level. But to be able, you know, as just a snippet here, to be able to um, listen to his ideation, uh, unconscious archetypes, alchemy, and not really give a rip about it, but listen to, because I enjoy him and I can learn from him, and his listening to my stuff and getting bored with it. I sent him a Christmas letter a couple years ago. He got through about the first page out of the 30 pages or whatever it was. I don't know. You know, So I'm not going to send him another Christmas letter. I mean, he's still working on the one from 1978. You know, so, um, but you know, to be able to know that is profound. We just can't do the justice that we'd like to do with it. So talk about it a little bit later. Let's look at slide 30 here. Using, we've already talked about this substantially, but using an abusing type theory, again, in summary, there are dangers and there are strengths, in my mind, to both sides. Uh, MBTI terminology has a four, all four elements of the personality type. There are combinations. Uh, David Kiersey, um, actually written by his uh, colleague uh, Marilyn Bates, but really it was his stuff. He's an NT. INTP, so he would never write anything probably in the long run, but um, 
the immense value of the, looking at these combinations is, uh, is superb. There is great value in looking at all four letter combinations. ESTJs are usually an INFPs or something else. Um, again, not something we're particularly going to focus on, but it does violence. It does violence to what Jung is saying, and it, you can get caught in it. The usefulness of it is that it's easy. Um, and there's a great deal of published research on this. And there's research on Jung's work, but it is, in simple terms, theoretical and ideational. The research that the MBTI people have done is more introverts are more like this, and ADHD people are more on this side, and, and uh, uh, Latino people are more somewhere else. So there is that kind of data that's uh, available. Maybe I can defer to you to the dangers of this, huh? I mean, we've certainly talked about that. I was just thinking about that, and um, I think one of the things that is implicit in, in the MBTI way of looking at things actually picks up something that, that uh, is in, in Jung's basic ideas, and that is that uh, with a uh, with your preferred attitude, preferred function, you're going to be on target. And that's going to work really well. Uh, if you look at uh, what Jung drew as a type wheel in his 1925 seminar, but you have, uh, it looks like the old, uh, on the old black and white TVs, you know, you get the circle with the cross in it and the lines are going out to adjust your TV. Well, that's kind of a type wheel, if you will. And so the superior function is up here at the top, and then you have an auxiliary. Uh, which is more or less under conscious control. See, that's where things start to get slippery. And uh, you could actually have a couple of auxiliary functions which are more or less under conscious control. That's what I was saying earlier this morning. Um, I think what the, the Myers-Briggs folks don't, or the MBTI folks don't bring out enough, is the acknowledgement that auxiliary functions uh, can be a little slippery depending upon how well you develop them. And so they may not be fully on target all the time, especially in a stress situation. If you have to produce and you have to use an auxiliary function, then you're going to be under stress, as Ron said, and the chances of screwing up are pretty good, or at least much higher. So uh, Ron's feeling function is fine. His interpersonal relatedness is great one-to-one, -one, as I experience him. But I think if he were put in a stress situation where interpersonal relatedness uh, was more on the line, it would be more problematic. In my case, uh, um, I think if I'm put on the line uh, in terms of, of my thinking function, yeah, I'm going to fumble around and stumble. If I have time ahead to lay it out, that's going to, that's going to be a lot better. So uh, what you said, Ron, about stress is, is a very important thing. So uh, I think what needs to be developed, and this is getting ahead a little bit into the psychopathology, I think what needs to be developed is a recognition and a way of identifying uh, when it is really intentional, usage, utilization of a function. When its a function is happening in an unstressed situation, so it looks like it's pretty good. And when it's more of a stress situation and you have a non-preferred function that's being called on, and it can be pretty sad, pretty sad performance. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, just um, add, those of you, I think most of you are familiar with the terminology of dominant function and so on, just for those of you who might not or how it's used. Um, we first look at, if we kind of back this to slide 29 uh, approximately, or one of Boris's slides earlier. Uh, the four functions, uh, one uh, Jung would suggest, and APT would affirm this, is that there's a dominant function, or sometimes referred to as a superior function. That is something that one does most naturally, perhaps best. It's uh, most ingrained, almost certainly neurologically. And then on the other end of the extreme, we have what's generally referred to as the inferior function, which is something that one does least well and is least developed, and probably we should say in some ways is primitive or infantile, and maybe does a great deal of uh, damage in one's uh, relationships and such in life. In between, 
uh, they're variously called, but uh, generally I think referred to as secondary function. That's the sort of thing that I do secondly best, and the tertiary function. And those words are uh, differentiators. We have, as it were, dominant, secondary, tertiary, and inferior. So, for instance, in my case, my dominant function is, is actually sensing. My secondary function is thinking. My tertiary function is intuition. And my inferior function is feeling. Uh, and uh, APT, and I'm not sure if you and you have to correct me on this, APT has a rather, um, or the MBTI people, what I consider to be a rigid uh, way of discovering what those are, I don't think that actually works. I think you really, really need to lurk, work at the two extremes first. What is my dominant function? What do I do with greatest ease? What do I struggle with? And you're exactly right. When I'm with him, when I'm with my wife, when I'm with my daughters, adult, my grand, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one person, my feeling function operates quite well. But here, with you all here, it's way back there, and you're going to see it because it's not developed. I can't do that and feel safe. So it's my inferior function. It's not that I don't know that it's there. And of course, it operates unconsciously if I had an unconscious to operate. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I just thought that would be important. Yeah. OK, shall we, shall we move on? Yes. We're at slide 31, if you will, or halfway down on page 9. And now we're bridging into, and this is just a summary here, really, sort of a bibliography, as it were. Uh, what we're going to look at in terms of psychopathology. We want to look at classifications of that. Um, we want to look at research on personality type to whatever degree we can. Uh, focus on introversion and extroversion and uh, pathology that erupts out of those uh, operations. And then my wife, um, who is Deb Brock, by the way, she says that I'm old school. I didn't change my name when we got married. Um, and she did some very interesting work on this, which we'll get to. Um, bottom of page nine, this is me. I actually prefer the term limitations over psychopathology, over problems, and I really detest the word issues. I mean, what the hell are issues anyway? I, issues. They got issues, right? Well, okay, I know it's popular. People use it, and I, I occasionally use this, I sort of have to, but I just like limitations because then it's not pathological. It's not something wrong with me. I have a limitation when it comes to a, a, a propagating of my feeling function, right? Or is it pathological? Well, of course it's pathological, but just don't tell me about it, and I'll do fine. If I can see another 10 or 20 years, I'll come back, and I'll be more feeling-based. Probably not. Um, so uh, the limitations can come from the inferior function, or functions, if you will, unconscious operations, society expectation, um, attachment, which we're going to focus on. I have some appendices that you want to look at, possibilities of limitations with introverts and extroverts, uh, appendices B and C. Um, okay on that? Okay on All that. All right. And so I want to look at this, really look at... Um, What are the basic classifications of psychopathology? Now, this isn't, again, a graduate course in psychopathology, but roughly they are these. They are mood disorders. That's slide 33 at the top of page 10. These would be depression, anxiety, and bipolar disorder, uh, some other combinations possibly. What I prefer to call character disorders, a DSM-4 uh, maintains personality disorder. I just don't like the phraseology, but maybe character disorder isn't any better. It's an older term. Um, but they, there are a variety of those. Importantly here, character disorders all have, and we'll look at the borderline disorder here, all have a narcissistic element, which in very brief terminology behaviorally is selfishness, but psychically is selflessness. I don't have a sense of self, so I behave selfishly. I'm doing some mm -hmm. disservice to Kahut and other people who do a much better job of that. Usually what we have with these character disorders, in which we'll focus on a bit more here, is a history that is this. There's a history of neglect. And when you're neglected, you will put up a fuss. And when you put up a fuss, you will be indulged. And when you indulged, 
you will want more, and then you will be shamed. So we have this nasty combination of neglect, lead to indulgence, lead to shame. So we have somebody who has not developed a sense of herself as a result of that is selfish. Can you see that package that works out? Now that doesn't describe all of it and, and so on. Thirdly, thought disorders, these would be uh, w uh, generally referred to as fragmentation, schizophrenic disorders, some bipolar disorders are in this. This is there's a delusional aspect, there's what's called loose association, a couple of other things, it's not our attention exactly, although we could look at each of these personality type functions and see them throughout. that you didn't finish your character disorder, could you please talk about the lack of self-development and excesses and extremes? Yes, right. Well, that would be the behavioral um, uh, manifestation of that. So if I have a personality or a, a personality disorder or a character disorder, what I will do is do something to an extreme. I will become, in a way, obsessive about something. I will be say, in our discussion today, excessively extroverted or excessively introverted or on one of the other functions I can do something of that sort. So that's what I have in mind with the excesses there. Not doing something wrong, just doing it to a fault, again, because of that lack of self. So I will fill that self up with something that ultimately doesn't make me feel better in the long run but does in the short run. And how could you say that a person is self, uh, has a lack of self-development? Oh, pardon me? So how would you say that someone has a lack of self-development? How do you detect that? The question is, how could, uh, uh, what would I say about somebody who has a lack of self-development? Yes, how would you detect that? May I defer that question to our discussion of uh, borderline and attachment people? a little bit later, probably this afternoon. It's a very relevant question. Okay, good question. Yeah. Okay. Addictive disorders, and somebody asked about this earlier, uh, really aren't an exact categorization. Well, they are in the DSM-4, um, but... Um, and, and situational disorders, which is, of course, what everybody wants to have. I have a situational disorder. Somebody else has a personality disorder, but, you know, it's, my, it's your fault, you know, at any rate. So that's usually what presents, right? <laughs> well, I just see men and women, um, excuse me, men and children in my practice, and, and I uh, say that the, all of the men that come in to see me have a certain disorder. They have a female handprint in their back, you know. Go see the therapist, you know, so it's... Uh, so she said that I have to be here. I don't know why I'm here. So. Now, I, I raced through that because we're talking about a graduate level course, but those of you who are not terribly familiar with this, I thought it might be of, of some help to sort of look at that. Um, I'm going to uh, skip the next two. Um, we'll come back if we have time. Uh, let's look just briefly at the... Uh, under more type and pathology, I have this labeled as number 35 on halfway through page 10. Um, look at some of the data here. For instance, uh, there's been a lot of work done with iSync's uh, instrument, which uh, identifies extroversion and neuroticism, among a couple of other things. And he has suggested, and there's been some interesting research showing that introverts, in very simple terms, have a lot more activity, neurological activity going on. Uh, and it appears that the ascending reticular activating system, the so-called ARAS, um, is operating more. Well, that makes some sense, doesn't it? Right? I mean, very often we psychologists do this research that tells us what we already know. And introverts have more activity going on inside because they have less activity going on outside. Well, not necessarily in that way, but it has to do with having to process you can't just have it come in. It can't just as it, it can't just have the data come in from outside, as it were, wherever the data is, and then act on it. It has. It takes more internal processing. The CPU is busier, so to speak. <laughs> yes. Right. And it's from that then that you get things like overloaded fatigue and the need to uh, 
uh, cut off the uh, flow of uh, stimuli and uh, recover. Thank you. Uh, still on slide um, 35 here, about third or fourth one down. I found this interesting. Extroverts perform better under stimulating, arousing situations, especially in the morning. And the reverse is true of introverts. Um, next one. Extroverts heavily influenced by reward and disregard punishments and mistakes. And introverts do the reverse of that. Let's take a moment and think about that. So what do we have here? You know, extroverts are looking for rewards until they get them. So they will say something that didn't work. They'll say something else that didn't work. It still doesn't work, so they'll say something else that didn't work, disregarding the rejection that they might have there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And introverts would... What, Boris? Uh, introverts uh, <laughs> would tend to uh, operate from the sense of this makes sense, this is meaningful, this fits, this suits me, and bring it out, and then discover that the environment doesn't like it. There is the punishment. There is the rejection. Because it's just so well, you know, it makes perfectly good sense to me, and I bring it out, and it turns out that it's, you know, a half-baked potato. Well, nobody likes a half-baked potato. There's several pieces of research. I've noted a couple here and a couple in uh, one of the appendices uh, in regards to a sense of well-being, usually referred to as SWB, sense of well-being. Uh, not surprisingly, again, I, this piece of research, which is extroverts have a better sense of well-being. In other words, they feel better about themselves. Now, why would that be? I mean, that's fairly intuitively obvious because they are outgoing and not looking for punishments, not examining unconscious factors, uh, not attending to rejections by and large. And introverts would be attending internally, right? So they have a less sense of, of, uh, of well-being. Well, that's problematic. That's not a problem. Introverts are generally, um, statistically, um, diagnosed more, in, more uh, depressed. Some other research here and above. Now, are they really, are introverts more depressed? Well, the research says, yes, they are more depressed. However, however I suspect a good deal of our research is uh, coming out of a essentially uh, uh, Caucasian Anglo culture <laughs> and how that would fit, say, in Japan. There's another question. It would be see, interesting to see what the Japanese research or uh, research from a culture that is markedly different in terms of the extroversion and introversion balance would be. Yes, exactly. Uh, there's some, uh, the APT people do a fair bit of this. Um, and it's, it's not what one would expect. Uh, Latino cultures are, um, at least with the MBTI, you know, in uh, Spanish form, show that Latinos are, interestingly, more introverted. So is that because they really are introverted? Or the culture, certainly, at least from us gringos, would look more extroverted. But indeed, the data seems to show that's not the case. So there are a lot of these sort of examinations that are in the process of being examined right now, and there are hundreds of, of these studies. Uh, the I think studies were in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and now uh, APTs overlap that, so there's a number of those things. Um, I skipped the page. You can look back at it a little bit, but what I'd like you to uh, spend uh, just a few minutes with me is um, uh, my wife Deb's uh, a dissertation on uh, type research. She um, did a uh, multivariate analysis of variants of MANOVA on gender, personality type, psychopathology, and religious orientation. So it's, uh, we can't do all of that, obviously, nor is it a purpose to do that. But some of the things that I think. Pardon me? Okay. Uh, some of the things that have been found is. 
this. Let's just look at them and, and maybe tease them apart and see what might be really true or might be artificially to sort of an artifact of our culture. NF, uh, uh, NF females are most well-adjusted. In other words, intuitive, feeling, females, most well-adjusted of all combinations. Okay? And NF males most maladjusted. Since I'm sitting next to an NF male, he seems reasonably adjusted. Now, just for fun, maybe even adapted. Maybe adapted. Maybe even adapted. Yes. So, is that is there not some implication to our culture about that? How does an NF person? I mean, uh, like Boris said, he pretended to be a T for 40 or 50 years, and right. and then discovered that that wasn't his real uh, preference, right? Well, um, how many classes are there in college on feeling? But there are classes on logic, right? Now, it's not that logic doesn't have a feeling element in it, but as it is taught, it is not that way. So we have a culture, at least, or so it seems, that suggests that if you're NF, you'll do better as a female. Now look a little bit further. And T females, moderately maladjusted. And being married to one of these kind, I will say that Deb has told me that being MBT terminology, an INTP, or an introverted, uh, introverted intuitive thinker, as a female, doesn't fit in the culture. Like, you know, I don't really care about your children or your grandchildren. What have you thought? You know, where, what have you read? Uh, what are what are your what's your inner working here? That's not typical female conversation. So, and that's a Hillary Clinton, INT, right? Hillary Clinton is not intrinsically likable. Not that some people don't like her. She's not intrinsically likable. She doesn't care about it actually. So, at any rate, that could suggest some of what that is. Chicago, quick question, if I could. Uh, just timing-wise, I noticed we're about 20 minutes or so into the lunch break that we had planned. Uh, did you want to keep going a little bit longer, or what are your thoughts of when should break? I know people have scheduled things they need to do over the lunch hour. Let's break right now. Are you sure? I don't want to push it, but you are in a good spot? We're in a good spot. Oh, we can maybe it. take questions okay. at the top of the, uh, of the hour. Okay, okay, good. Well, thank you then. We will reconvene in one hour, so I guess about five minutes to to our time, five minutes to one, your central time. So we'll see you all soon then. Great. Folks will be interested to know we'll have more stragglers in Asheville because President Obama is en route as we speak, and they've shut down, not here, he's en route to the Grove Park Inn, but they've shut down every uh, overpass and freeway in town. So, so that if you cross the freeway, you can't cross back until President Obama's limousine has gone through. So, and our, our chief technical person was on the other side of the freeway, but <laughs> but luckily he, he knew the back roads and the police hadn't cordoned those off yet, so he just skated by and has made it, which we are very pleased you know, for. Um, so we may have a few less people here in Asheville due to the president. Hold on one second, Meg. Okay, nothing. I was giving a sign by somebody. So without further ado, we'll turn it back over to Chicago, and thank you. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we want to start and continue uh, our program and start with uh, some comments about attachment. Page 11 in your handout. So um, as I was saying to uh, Ron over lunch, um, I think the fundamental a fundamental useful point of view about attachment is that those early experiences that are labeled attachment are really uh, a wiring of the infant's child's brain. Uh, so wiring what will uh, be acceptable and functional in that given environment. Uh, there's a lot more that uh, could come out uh, perhaps, but if there is not the uh, receptivity and the responsiveness to it, then either it's uh, going to be recessive or it's going to come out uh, because you've got a very strong uh, very strong child that insists on you're going to see me regardless of where you are. 
which is really very important. You're probably familiar with uh, <coughs> the tragedy in Romania 20, 30 years ago where infants were, uh, uh, Ceausescu, who was the president then, suggested that everybody should have a number of children. They did. My, my older daughter had the privilege of being over there working in one of these orphanages, and there are many. Um, so people were having five or six children, and a lot of these children then were adopted out, many of them to Americans and other places. And, and these children have, uh, to the person almost, uh, attachment disorders because they have not been properly attached. And these attachment disorders are no doubt about it, <clears throat> neurological phenomena. Mm -hmm. Now, we won't have time to uh, talk a lot about it, but there is uh, in the literature now and in the psychological community what we generally call a reprogramming, which is really uh, getting um, one part of your brain to do what the other part doesn't. For instance, my daughter, or my other daughter, has MS, and her lesions are left side, which is, uh, among other things, <coughs> reading, writing, arithmetic, it's primarily the, the conceptual side, verbal side. So uh, because she is working diligently on that side, that forces her right side to do what the left side does. So there is some reparation that can be done, but reparation we do want to see as uh, functionally neurological. Again, it's not our duty to do that today or our privilege, but what Boris says is right. So if you look on uh, what I identify as uh, slide number 37, that's the top one on 11, what we'll do here for the next few minutes in attachment is uh, ask, what is it? Look at the theory of attachment. <clears throat> look at a primary classification and secondary classifications of attachment. And then look at attachment disorders. Some research on that. And ultimately look at what we've already alluded to several times, at how can type uh, create attachment or uh, perhaps sadly create uh, lack of attachment. The uh, slide 38 actually is a uh, sentence that I took from uh, a book that's referenced in your, in your bibliography by David Wallin, W-A-L-L-I-N, who's written a very fine book on uh, attachment in psychotherapy, and I highly recommend the book. It's well-researched, it's well-written, and it's extremely informative. <laughs> So David Wallen quotes uh, Hobson when he says, one's experiences of relations with others become a feature of one's relations with oneself. Uh, awesomely uh, phrased uh, sentence, I would say. Uh, basically, it's uh, saying what uh, I was mentioning earlier, that uh, how we uh, interact and how our parenting people interact with us uh, is going to uh, condition what's uh, acceptable to them, to the environment we grow up in, and unfortunately, and this is the kicker, uh, what we consider about ourselves to be acceptable. That's where it gets nasty. So, all right, one's experiences of relations with others become a feature of one's relations with oneself. And then again, uh, drawing on Wallen's book in slide 39, Co-created relationships and attachment are the key context for development. We've all heard probably about mirroring from uh, 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 Kohut and then from others. Uh, well, mirroring is is one of the ways you know when we recognize somebody, when we acknowledge, when we actually can tune in to what they're doing, what they're saying, as with uh, Ron's grandson Gavin. Uh, then that bond starts to develop, that flow back and forth. The second thing here, pre-verbal experience makes up the core of the developing self. And this is something that uh, the therapists among us are probably well aware of, that uh, to use a phrase from uh, Thomas Ogden, there is the unthought known, something that somebody knows in their bones and in their, in their flesh no way to articulate it, but that's just the way things are. Powerful, powerful idea. So pre-verbal experience, that's the, the playing with the infant, the uh, mimicking, the uh, over uh, overdoing the, uh, the cooing, um, <coughs> but it's wiring the brain, it's giving a, uh, an acknowledgement, it's a tuning in, which then we infer of the infant and the young child uh, actually experiences as uh, being seen, being understood. 
And then we get to this third statement, the stance of the self toward experience predicts attachment security better than the facts of personal history. So here we've gone to a uh, adolescent or adult level in this statement, I think, that um, the stance of the self toward experience um, How does one uh, deal with what happens? You know, personal history is one thing, but how do we relate to what happens to us, what to what goes on in us, those sorts of things? <clears throat> so, Ron, you want to say something? About well, that? I, I like very much what you uh, put in this uh, slide 37, especially the top. It, it says that I, as <clears throat> an extrovert. Uh, have to work at relating to you as an introvert, although it must be much easier for you to relate to me. Well, the, the, the fact that we, uh, I grew up in an extroverted culture and learned how to deal with it. I grew up in an extroverted culture and didn't have to learn how to grow up in an introverted culture. Exactly. And there we have. Exactly. The difference. I, you know, I tease you. Yes, ex exactly right. But for us to relate, mm -hmm. I have to know myself so I can know you. Right. And it's work. Both are work. <laughs> yes. You know. And the work that I've done on sensation and thinking kinds of things allows me to honor and value the little that you have done there. Right. Right. Yes. <laughs> Especially in the sensation. <laughs> uh, the theory of attachment is uh, slide 40, on page 11, is really uh, just a sort of a brief summary of <clears throat> what. Uh, what happens in normal attachment? Normal attachment is I am physiologically attached to a mother. And then uh, the birth is, uh, is traumatic for all of us. I become unattached. And of course, that, that is difficult. Those of us who have been in the, the birthing room, and I dare not say I know what you feel. You know, my wife said you do not. Um, and then early attachment to mother or mother figure. And it can be mother figure. It doesn't have to be mother. Of course, there are many adoptions that are very successful. And there are mothers that die, and uh, the surrogate mother, and a variety of other kinds of things. And, uh, by the way, because my, my daughter can't conceive now, after Gavin, my, uh, my other daughter it will be the carrier, the surrogate mother. And so she will be biological mother in one way, but not uh, the fetus is not her biological child. So I mean, a variety of other kinds of attachments we can't have. And then some inadequate attachment is unavoidable. I cannot be perfectly attached. Uh, and so what happens then is I cope in some way or another. And I think of attachment not as together, not as separately, but as a flow of together and apart and together and apart. So when we're really talking about attachment, we are talking about attachment and detachment. So these two phenomena are really important in the, in the over realm of attachment. But it is really detachment. Don't you know that many folks are not good at detaching. In very simple terms, we haven't talked a lot about this function, but as a T person, as a thinker, I'm good at detaching. I can detach with the best of them. You know? So my kind of attachment in life, figuratively, is here. Boom. Boom. <laughs> and the feeling friends of mine attach like this. <laughs> so uh, there are problems with that regardless. So to uh pick up on what Ron is saying about the detaching part. There's a line that uh, Winnicott uh, is famous for, and that is being able to be alone in the presence of another. Now, what that is talking about, and what that's showing is that um, there are, uh, there's been an experience. The mother and the child have had the kind of experience in which um, being together does not mean being merged, but being alone with somebody does not mean being isolated. It's, if it sounds paradoxical, uh, I, I really don't think it is paradoxical, because I think we've all had that experience. The experience of being in the presence of somebody, but we can just pay attention to what we're thinking and what we're doing, and it feels just wonderful. Or we can be in the presence of physically in the presence of somebody, and it feels so isolated we want to get out of there. So uh, a successful attachment experience as an infant and child 
will give the person the possibility of being, if you will, self-contained, preoccupied in the presence of another person, but nobody is feeling a pushing away or an isolation. And in, and being together with somebody doesn't necessarily have to be a gooey merger either. I'd like you to uh, take just a moment, I don't want to uh, spend much time on this, and look at appendices uh, F and G on page 3 in the appendices at the end, and just look at what I've identified there as being <coughs> potentially pathological and non-pathological origins of attachment disorders. We normally think of the mother wasn't good enough or something of that sort as she rejected. Those are all possibly there under Appendix F. The mother was unable to attach and, uh, or unable to detach. Uh, and other mother was abusive mother figure, of course. But then there are non-pathological. Mother dies. Uh, sibling dies or leaves home. I, my wife's treating somebody who is, uh, has an attachment disorder whose sibling died when she was five and mother attended to the sibling and the dead sibling and grieving and then understandably non-pathologically detached from her daughter. We can say, well, she should have, but she was doing what she needed to do, but that still then caused an end. So, just roughly here, I mean, there, you, you could have neurological disruption or change of living situation. All of these things are non-pathological. Well, so we're back to uh, page 12. Ainsworth was the first person to identify uh, different kinds of attachment, and, and Ainsworth suggested secure and insecure, and then separated insecure into avoidant and ambivalent slash anxious. Also an appendix, appendix there if you want to look that up. And there have been some other uh, exam and other you know, ways of looking at different kinds of attachment. Secure is what Boris has said. Secure is, again, I can attach and detach whether I'm introverted or extroverted or anything else. But insecure is there, in my mind, I have the sense that something is wrong. And for an infant or a child, that something is wrong really translates as there's something wrong with me, which creates profound self-esteem problems. You certainly know that the data shows that, with few exceptions, when parents get divorced, the child thinks it is my fault that they got divorced. And why in the world? Or abused children would say, well, it was my fault that he abused me. I shouldn't have been such and such. That is normal. That is not pathological. A child looks at, an, at a parent or a parent figure with, a, we would call it naive, but appropriate, he, she is taking care of me. And when that individual is not there, something is wrong generally with me. So I will become avoidant or I will become anxious, ambivalent. I would put in anxious ambivalent, and I would even put as a third category fusing, but, but Boris has suggested that's really part of the anxious ambivalent. So I think what you see in, in the sort of phenomenon out there is when people have attachment disorders, they roughly avoid to a fault, or they connect to a fault, but their connections are anxious. I'm going to lose you, aren't I? So I'll hang on to you all the time. Yeah, one of the subcategories that's been identified here by, by uh, I can't tell you exactly which researchers, but they call it the hyperactivating, uh, which uh, what you're speaking reminds me of, Ron. The uh, child is working really hard to get the attention. So uh, that in some ways moves us down here to slide 42 um, under the ambivalent, the third one. Um, ambivalent preoccupied, no room for minds of, mind of one's own. So that you can see in that situation where uh, the child has, or the infant has not been mirrored, has not been acknowledged, has not gotten that sense that to be what the child is, is okay. But the child has to be something else that the parent wants. So there's that, uh, that urgency and that dependency on getting the uh, acknowledgement, which is of course conditional acknowledgement from the parent. 
and it's called hyperactivating because it works at it, works at it, works at it all the time. No room for a mind of one's own. So let's consider um, <clears throat> what might be the potential problems, if we will, or limitations in regards to attachment that introverts might have and that extroverts might have. Introverts, I think, fair to say, would be inclined towards avoidant if attachment is a problem. Extroverts, I think, would be inclined towards artificial, I wouldn't say genuine connection, but a fusing or this anxious sort of phenomenon. I'm not sure that they would fall into that category. I would imagine the opposite. Would you? Um, I'm listening. I think because the introvert has uh, the potential to be reading other people's mind, they they want to become attached and to connect it very close. And the extrovert is because it's so worried about what's going on outside, they may be avoiding um, deep contact because intimacy is difficult for them. Before we go beyond this, and I want to come back to your comment here, and uh, I'll repeat that in just a minute. Um, let me just suggest in slide 43 the different possibilities here. And then we're going to open it up for a few questions about this because this is dreadfully important. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my grandson is in predominantly an extroverted family, even though he is quite introverted by nature. His father is introverted, but my daughter, my older daughter, is so extroverted that the flavor of the family is extroverted. It is potentially pathological, even though there's no pathology in my mind with my son, with my, uh, excuse me, daughter, my daughter, my son-in-law, and my and my uh, grandson. grandson, or the feeling-based person in a thinking-based family. That would be me, by the way. Both of my family, uh, family, uh, both of my parents were extroverted feelers. I'm an extroverted thinker. The 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 saving element might have been that my brother was also a thinker, and we colluded. The person who was really damaged in my family was my sister, who was an introverted feeler in this environment where she connected feeling, as it were, but wanted to do it in an introverted way. And my parents, hovering around them, always talking, always jabbering, pushed her into a corner, and then some other phenomena happened there. So 43 is just some examples of that. but. Boris? Yes. Um, one of the, uh, well, you said it all, really, in a way. Uh, <coughs> difference, uh, typological difference between individual and environment, uh, unimproved, if you will, uneducated uh, individual and uneducated environment is going to result in not being seen, not being understood, not feeling welcome regardless of what the mix happens to be. Uh, and so uh, there are some there are some options, you know. Uh, the person with an introverted preference and a very rich uh, inner life and paying attention to that uh, is not going to um, either be recognized uh, for her or his uniqueness nor feel very welcomed in a place where it's all let's go out and play. All right, let's all go out and, and roughhouse, uh, just as an example. So I think the point is that uh, when neither the individual nor the persons around the individual are aware of these legitimate uh, differences in attitude type and function type, you end up with misunderstandings. And you end up then with uh, feedback from the environment that is not supportive, that uh, on, on the contrary may be very judgmental. And so that will uh, undermine the individual. Now, if in fact our society is primarily extroverted or thinks it's supposed to be, which is roughly the same thing, uh, you end up with a lot of people uh, pretending there's something that they are not really. A lot of inauthenticity, I would say. There's a judgment statement. <laughs> okay. um, for the intuitive person, the person who sees possibilities, 
in a family that is basically uh, sensation oriented. Those are two fundamentally different ways of perception. And so the sensation members of the family, sensation uh, function members of the family are going to say, boy, you're really off the wall. You're flaky. You know, where do you get that? You're from another planet. And the person uh, whose uh, natural inclination is, to in, uh, is intuitive is going to feel uh, deluged with uh, hard, hard data, if you will, factual stuff. Uh, or think, God, these people are really boring. You know, all they can do is think about facts and figures or where the next meal is coming from or, you know, doing something. Doing something. Don't just do something. Sit there. You know? <laughs> So uh, you can see then how, from the very beginning of life, this kind of difference between familial environment, particularly parenting person, and the, the child, or the, inf the uh, infant or child, uh, can have some very long-term consequences because it sets in motion uh, processes that give, in this case, the infant or the child a sense of, here's who the world thinks I am. And to a great extent, we think we are what the world thinks we are, what the people around us think we are. And it, you know, that keeps us therapists in business. <laughs> I'm doing that, Mr. I'd like to, uh, uh, before we open this up for questions, which I think we'll do in a moment, is just to bring back to a theme that is important to me, and I think to Boris as well, or to those of us who are therapists. And the theme is, um, what I would simply prefer to call sadness. Um, sadness, in my mind, is uh, the most important feeling that we have because we lose everything that we have in life. We lose our lives, we lose our children, we lose our parents, we lose our ideas, we lose every piece of property that we have in some way or another. And if I love something or someone and lose it, I will feel sad. I will feel sad. I should feel sad. Now, the beauty of sadness is that it helps me process that loss. It's an absolute necessary phenomenon in life to be able to engender sadness and, uh, and appreciate it. What I tell my patients and myself frequently is that sadness is based on love. If I love something, I'm going to feel sad in some way or another. And to avoid that is to avoid the essence of what attachment is. Because um, today alone, here, there will be a myriad of elements of sadness with each of you, and certainly with me. There will be things later that I should have said, uh, not many, uh, there will be many more things that I shouldn't have said, perhaps too many, and I will appropriately feel sad. And I will have one or more kinds of expletives associated with them because I should have or shouldn't have. Sadness. Now, does that mean just should have or shouldn't have? Or does that mean that's a natural part of my being an extrovert? Generally, saying too much and wishing I hadn't. Probably the opposite with Boris to some degree, if I dare read his mind. But this, this piece is important with attachment. Attachment does not mean... Uh, no sadness. In fact, it means sadness. What we very often have with attachment disordered people is a lack of sadness. And depression, in his my mind, is a failure to be sad. You get sad, you will overcome your depression. You uh, realize you're anticipating sorrow. This anticipatory sorrow is really anxiety in there. And we certainly could look at uh, addictions. Uncover an addiction, Find a depression, uncover a depression, find a sadness, uncover that, find love. Well, that's a fine thing, but it's hard to get there. So my thought about that attachment. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So you can see if you take it back to the infant or child situation, there are going to be failures. As children, we were not fully seen. If we were seen well enough, we were very fortunate. But that's the, that's the, I mean, there were things that my mother said that still make me sad because she didn't see and she didn't, couldn't comprehend. And it's been a lifelong, uh, I was going to say curse is the word that came up, you know. She meant very well. She just couldn't get there. Sadness. You know, doesn't mean I was bad or that I was wrong as I look back. But 
uh, that certainly was a feeling that I carried for a long time. So, sadness. Shall we uh, do a bit of borderline, or shall we do questions right well, now? Well, let's, let's, let's see if there's some questions out there. Let's do that. Steve, you want Steve? to do a round of questions? Yeah, certainly. In a moment, we'll open it up, maybe in this order this time, Asheville, Wilmington, and Mexico. Before we do, one technical question or comment. Uh, for the Chicago feed, anybody leaning over the table is ending up in the, the video feed. So if we can either pan the camera a little more towards Ron or if people can lean back from the table, that will probably be a little bit helpful, so it's not too distracting. And let's start then in Asheville. Any questions here in the room at Asheville? Yep, one question. Sandy? Um, I have a question for Ron. Um, could you say a little more about your wife's experiences in NT? in the world, female, NT, is that what you said? You yes, yes, right. Um, the, right. The question that you may not have heard is, uh, your name please? Sandy. Sandy. Sandy uh, says, uh, asked that I mention a bit more, my wife being an NT, actually INTP for those of you flowing with that. Um, uh, Deb's experience with that has been that uh, she has had a deuce of a time relating to what I might say is the typical female in America, which would be SF or NF at least, and has um, uh, <coughs> learned to do that sort of phenomenon. But her interest in life is, is inquiry, examination, uh, understanding, uh, self-understanding, and um, especially that INT uh, combination is, is deadly in a way because uh, let me tell you everything that's wrong with you. That will help you, won't it? You know, so, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> when I play golf with my INTJ uh, brother-in-law, he uh, chips from 80 yards out up to about three yards from the pin, and I say, great shot, and he says, no, actually, it should have been a little bit to the left, you know, and I want to think to my, that's the last compliment you'll get from me today. <laughs> Um, so there's that sort of truth-seeking, I think, about the NT, uh, and, and especially NT females, you too, right? That, you know, I'm looking for the truth here, and, and you know, I don't care what you feel, really, or what I feel. I mean, that's important, I know, technically. Deb's a psychologist, so she knows that it has to be there. And, but the suffering that has been a result of that has been, what's wrong with me? Why don't people like me? And what I tell her is, you know, the phenomenon here is you people are just not likable. So, <laughs> I try not to say that terminology with my black son-in-law, you know, the you people thing. But I mean, it's uh, teasingly, it's like that. Um, it is, it's a noblesse oblige, if you will. It's, it's um, uh, as an NT female, I mean, who are the NT females? That would be uh, Margaret Mead. That would be Madame Curry, that would be uh, Madeleine Albright, you know, all of these people you think, I think fairly are antiques, but they're not likable. So what? See, this speaks to the difference between these two ways of, of uh, operating in the J dimension. Uh, objective truth would be the T, just the facts, uh, the, what the facts are. And the, the uh, feeling function would, in the extroverted sense, in Jung's extroverted sense of the feeling function, is not primarily emotional, uh, although it can be emotional, but in Jung's sense, the extroverted feeling function has to do with that interpersonal sensitivity, the interpersonal valuing, so that from the speaker's standpoint, this comment will be hurtful or not hurtful to the other person I'm talking to. Okay, that would be the feeling function operating. We're talking a little bit different dialects here, you know, it's Dutch and German, so whatever. <laughs> Swedish and Norwegian. Yes, that's close. All right. Which are you? <laughs> Swedish, Swedish. All right, I'm Norwegian then. <laughs> um. Well, thank you. Is there a second Asheville question? No. Okay, so Wilmington. Any questions from Wilmington? Mm. I just have a question about the categorization, um, that risk and danger of categorizing and using symbols to put somebody in a category, how we then perceive them through our own expectations. I'm wondering how this is addressed in this model. 
Well, it's addressed in two ways. Uh, if we take it from Jung's standpoint, one of the first things he says is he had absolutely no interest in putting people in boxes. He was interested in uh, uh, developing a way of um, looking at uh, the differences among people in such a way that every single person looked at would say, this particular way of looking at me really fits me. So that uh, there would be that level, you'd get acknowledgement from everybody, so that Ron could be identified as uh, sensation thinking preference, I could be identified as intuitive feeling preference, and I say, yeah, that's really got it, that's really got it. Now the second level though is, uh, that Jung took this from the standpoint of consciousness. We can observe what people consciously do. And then he wanted to push this back then. Uh, he couldn't in the, in the 19, uh, by 1921, uh, to a level that's basically neurological. He says in uh, somewhere in psychological types that um, basically these differences have to be grounded in our neurology. So he's really looking for a ruthlessly objective, if you will, uh, way of talking about manifest differences. Uh, so pigeonholing people was not Jung's intention. Unfortunately, uh, popularly, that's what it's uh, come to. I'm such and such, and you're such and such, and ne'er shall the twain meet. Well, unfortunately, the twain has met here, you know? We do pretty damn well, so. I think uh, what I do with MBTI is try to help people understand the boxes that they are already in so they can get out of those boxes. And I think we don't know the boxes that we have put ourselves in. And, and uh, those boxes are defensive. They are not the whole of what I am. So there's, as I said, what I call in, in defensive introversion and defensive extroversion. That, that's not natural. So there's huge dangers of and I, uh, as much as I have valued what I've got out of the MBTI and EPT, there's great danger of putting people in boxes, and there's great simplicity there. So I affirm your, the rhetoric underneath your rhetorical question. Thank you. Wilmington, any other question? Yeah, one more, please. Mm -hmm. Hi, Elena. Um, looking at this classification of attachment, I wonder, um, you know, in the secure, avoid, and, am and ambivalent types, has there been much research or conversation about um, how that may begin prior to birth, those, those um, responses to, you know, that life of the parent, like in utero? Not to my knowledge. There hasn't been. There's been a huge amount of examination of it, and I think you might think uh, there's an appendix that has some of the data here and a, and a bibliography in regards to that, but your question whether it's in utero, to my knowledge, never, at least what I know of it. Uh, <laughs> you might consult uh, David Wallen's book. Uh, his is also in the bibliography. Uh, Wallen has done a very fine job of uh, summarizing uh, the research, from starting with uh, John Boldy's work, and he's come right on up through in a very good way. So. Uh, he, his bibliography might conceivably address that, but likewise, as Ron said, I have no knowledge that of any of that sort of research. Most of this has been actually uh, based on infant parent interaction observation. Interaction between the, the parent and the child even before the child is born? No. Well, there is data on uh, the psychological state of mother. Uh, right. If mother is depressed, if mother is anxious or highly stressed, we know that. Uh, but uh, interfacing that with attachment itself, I, I don't believe that's been examined. I guess what I, the reason I'm asking that as well is when I'm working with some parents who are having some uh, challenges with their children, and they have a couple of siblings, and there's a there's a lot of variation between the, the personalities of the children, and sometimes the parents have pointed to, especially the mother, her condition during the time of pregnancy, and that may have been part of the reason the child was displaying a certain personality type or, you know, more attachment to the mother or more detachment. I just, I was just wondering, but that was an interesting thought, just seeing it from a clinical standpoint. Yes. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
in Mexico City. Any questions from Mexico? Um, there's one question. Um, I was wondering whether you could say that a person could be an extroverted person as a compensation for an uh, introverted nat uh, nature, or whether uh, it's possible for a person to be introverted in one area or dimension of life and extroverted in another area of life, or whether both scenarios would be possible. I said earlier, and I think it's true, that uh, I think we have a basic nature, introverted or extroverted. And then we have operations. How do I operate? As I said earlier, the introverted used car salesman operates as an extrovert. And then thirdly, uh, he can uh, develop his, uh, his alternate attitude and become better at it. But I think, I use the word home. I think an introvert will always go home, essentially internal inside oneself and, and, and become re-energized. The other piece that I would remind you of is that in Jung's original usage, which I'm very fond of, of course, uh, he's saying that introversion and extroversion are directions of adaptation, if you will, direction of attention, the purpose of which is to interface optimally, either with the world, so there would be your extroverted, or with one's own nature, there would be the introverted. And so when that is well developed, you know, optimally developed, a person is going to be able to deal with what's uh, the environment uh, situation offering and demanding, but likewise uh, deal optimally with what uh, one's essential nature is offering to one's consciousness. So there it could look like, well, which way does this person go? But I would agree with Ron that ultimately there is that sense of home. Uh, we had a term here suggested, Ron suggested residence, and with a D, and others suggested her resonance with an N. Both work. Thanks. Good question. Mexico, do you have a, a second question at this time? No, no not for the moment. I'm sorry, was that not, not at this moment, you said? No, it wasn't, no. Okay, okay, well, thank you. So so back to you, Chicago, and of course, feel okay. free to ask local questions from Chicago of our presenters. All right, we have a question here. Yeah, I have a question relating type and nature versus nurture. In other words, uh, can a child's type be molded by the parents or parent substitutes, or is it a hardwired thing that they're stuck with? I would suggest that... Uh, uh, the basic nature can be distorted. Uh, I'm using a stronger word. Uh, I think uh, what we will see is that people will, uh, uh, children will try to work with the situations given and the feedback that's given to them, but will end up in a falsification of their basic nature and to the extent that the basic nature is not recognized and acknowledged and supported. As Ron has earlier said, you know, accepted and encouraged, you're going to end up with some degree of falsification with consequences. In an ideal situation, you have your personality type, let's say introverted, affirmed. Your self-esteem grows around your introversion, among other parts of your personality. You then naturally add to that a dimension of externality or extroversion and can actually function quite well as an extrovert. But still, the operation inside, the neurological functioning is introverted, and you will go back home at least to recover and restore. So the data, at least on this dimension, is clear that, that there's more activity uh, with introverts. The other uh, personality elements, almost certainly, we're not quite sure. And then we have some other elements, uh, cultural elements in particular, that, that convolute um, the, the examination. I hope I can express this right, but when there is this falsification of the basic nature because it was not affirmed or um, it was invalidated, right. um, that I'm just thinking back to Winnicott and the false personality, the as if or the contingency oriented personality. That in itself would be an attachment problem because you would always be eyeing the environment for what's correct, either for reinforcement or for out-and-out survival. So
so I, I guess I'm either commenting or asking you to elaborate on, you know, on how this invalidation wrecks people. Frankly, I think more of a comment than a question, and I think it stands on its own merit, yes. I function as if I were something else, and because that, I needed to do that to survive. Yes, and how does that affect people, I mean, attachment, does it make, I'm guessing, like, absurd or, you know, overdone or ridiculous dependency, because it's not coming from you, so you're always asking people. Um, you know, what will, what will, why, you know, what will, what will work, right. and you're always worried um, far beyond what would be normal about rejection from people who are providing you with the information as to how to survive. In my mind, my theme of sadness, you have not learned, you, I, anyone, one, one has not learned to grieve a loss. I uh, don't have as much attachment as I like, I grieve. You know, uh, I have too much, I grieve, uh, and, but that grief, grief is not in place. Instead of that, we have this fusing, or we have the uh, avoidance, and neither one of them allows for normal grief. Your, everything you've said uh, is, I would say, statement more than question, uh, right on the money, right? Absolutely on target. Uh, and what has, uh, what has occurred to me as I'm listening uh, is that what we can observe is some people have self-confidence and can act and speak and live with what I would call authority. And there are other people who, under the best of conditions, do not have a sense of authority. Now, that sense of authority, I would suggest, uh, arises from uh, being able to, to know one's fundamental, or have a gut sense of one's fundamental being, and act and speak from that. It's the, uh, did you say self-confidence, self-assurance uh, that Ron mentioned earlier? And that comes from, as he said, you know, if the child wants to play the flute rather than learn the arithmetic, let her play the flute for three or four years and she'll learn the arithmetic when she needs it. But that then uh, authenticates and validates the basic nature and then that's the home ground you're standing on your own bedrock, uh, typologically speaking. And from there, everything can blossom. But as you so accurately said, if that is not the case, then there's the uncertainty, the insecurity, the questioning, the looking for, does this fit, and not knowing if it fits. I mean, it's a terrible, terrible experience, you know. How do I get along here? It looks like I do it this way, but it never flies. You know, other people do the same thing, and it's wonderful, but I do the same thing and it falls flat. Well, that's coming from an inauthentic place, which is not a value judgment in and of itself. It's simply saying that one has never uh, had the, the, the good fortune to be validated in one's essential nature so that one can then grow from that ground. I told Boris uh, the other day when we were having breakfast um, I, I was surprised because we've been having breakfast together for about 10 years or 8 years or something and I said, you know, Boris, you only get about 30% of me <laughs> because if I would give 100% of him, me, to him, I would completely overwhelm him. So I have learned over time to govern my extroverted nature. And even as we speak, I will tell you, in this moment, I'm governing at least 50% of what I am. That's not repressing it. It's just governing it because I've learned that if I go with my nature here, it is overwhelming and it's not helpful. And Boris said, well, I'm so surprised at that. I hope to get more than that. And then the next time I said, well, Boris, how much do you give me of yourself? And he sat back and he said, well, probably about 20%. <laughs> That's what I give everybody. <laughs> Adaptation, by the way. Adaptation. One more question back here, and then we'll carry on. Um, so if, if uh, type is um, neurological when you're inborn, then are, are there any studies of parent-child, or, or parent-ability, let's say? Has anyone ever looked at, at type um, across generations? Very little, unfortunately. Very little. It's, uh, it's dreadfully important. 
it's just dreadfully important. Because Hundreds of studies. Yes. So obviously it's complex because it's not like you come from an extrovert family, therefore you're extrovert. It's not like that. Yeah, Steve, and for those of you who may not have heard this, uh, the question is are there studies that would deal with uh, parent and child differences in personality type? Very little, and we really need to do that. I mean, even informally, I mean, just field study would be valuable. I mean, I make reference to my daughter, my grandson, just very, very important study. I think it would be interesting to do the comparison with grandparents because a lot of times grandparents are very important in the child's life and um, in some cultures more than parents. The comment was that grandparents can be very important in a person's life, more so in some cultures than, than other. Latino culture. That too? Yes, too. Uh, should we go on, Steve, or is there? Yeah, I think it's good. Why don't you go ahead and proceed? Thank you. <laughs> okay, Steve's in the restroom. Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> we're on the bottom of page twelve here. Now we, or should we take a break? Uh, we, we've just been at forty minutes. We should go for a bit, Jen. I would say let's take a brief break and then we'll carry on to the end of the day. Okay. Okay. So we'll do borderline and then we'll do uh, some young application and we're good for the day. So let's uh, take 10, 12 minute break. I have 12 minutes to the hour, so let's go at the hour, okay? Yes, good. Thank you. Thank you.